how can we harness technology innovation during times of crisis? I'm Michael Krigsman. I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. And we're speaking with Matthew Putman. He is the CEO of Nanotronics and with David Bray of Atlantic Council. Matthew, it's great to see you. Please tell us about Nanotronics. Great, thanks. It's, it's great to be on this with, with you and with David. Uh, Nanotronics is a science and technology company. What is really interesting about Nanotronics is that we make artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, imaging that works across many different industries. So while we make a product that is software and hardware, we get to see a lot of things that are going on in many different fields, uh, which is, I think, good for our conversation here and addressing issues like COVID. Fantastic. And David, tell us about Atlantic Council and your role there. Uh, always great to see you, Michael. Great to see you, Matthew, as well. The, the Atlantic Council has been around since 1961, and it really is based on the adage that it's we're stronger together with allies and partners. That 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 if if we go it alone, uh, we 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 may not be as adaptable as nimble as we need to in the changing world. However, if we work across nations and across sectors for for a common purpose and common good, that's better, and, and that's something that will actually be stronger and uplift us all. I, I'm director of the new Geotech Center that specifically is looking at the geopolitics of technology how it's changing our world, how it's changing how societies relate to each other and how companies work together. So I'm really honored to be here with both Matthew and you, uh, Michael, to have the conversation about how tech innovation can help us through crises like COVID-19. And certainly collaboration is going to be an important part of our discussion. Matthew, let's start with you. Why is technology innovation so important during times like we're in right now, dealing with COVID-19, dealing with the coronavirus and shelter in place. Why is technology innovation important now? Well, this has been true, not only for what we're dealing with right now, but dealing with crises in the past. Uh, we look at epidemics of the past. We look at, I think, almost a wartime mentality of how we have to uh, address this issue that is enormously uh, devastating to us all. What is the positive, the upside of that is there has been amazing science that has been done that, is not, that can now be deployed and be deployed with the amount of urgency that is needed to really get over this. So there are technologies and fields ranging from genomics to new types of electronics to new ways of doing um, automation uh, that really will shorten the impact of this if we do it right. Uh, and will also open the public's mind to what is possible. Uh, I, think, I think now is really unique in our lifetimes for something like that. And to build on what, what Matthew was saying, what I, what I love about what he's emphasizing is this recognition that the times of crises are also times of opportunity. And in fact, I think the Mandarin word can actually be translated into both. They're almost like these pivotal, these pivoting moments in which we can either have things go one way or the other. And I think if we go into doom and despair, I mean, yes, COVID-19 is serious and we need to address it. Yet we also need to recognize that the way we humans have ever gotten through crises like this, uh, whether they were human caused like war or human caused through natural disasters like other types of infectious diseases or responding to other types of environmental disasters, we get through them by working together and being smarter about the tools, the technology and the choices we're using. And so I look at public health and having done bioterrorism preparedness back in 2000 to 2005, Public health has actually kind of been a neglected field in terms of how science and how technology can help it. And that's partly because when things are going great, everyone sort of sees public health as invisible. It doesn't need to do anything. It's not really that exciting thing to do. But now that we've actually called attention to the fact that we are all connected as a planet and what we each choose to do can impact us all through COVID-19 and other future events like this, maybe now's our time to actually think about how do we want to use technology, data, and other advances that can be used 
to create better societies uh, like the type that, that Matthew was mentioning, whether they be 3D printing, whether they start thinking about data and AI, computer vision. There's all these possible opportunities that we can channel for good for us as a planet. Matthew, there are so many different possibility, technology possibilities that are out there. How do we begin to narrow the field in order to identify the most promising options that can help us? Yeah, I think there's some clues that we probably already see. So clues that have happened uh, with technologies that seem to have nothing to do with COVID. So we're all familiar with the fact that artificial intelligence is being used in our lives for some purposes. Now, artificial intelligence mainly has been used for the purpose of advertising to us. Uh, so this brings us certain great things and straight uh, opportunities, but we know that this technology is there. Now, what if artificial intelligence allows us to, com to communicate differently? I think in order to build things rapidly. We are limited as humans as to what we can build and what we could build in a cost-effective manner. Artificial intelligence allows things like corrective action during a process to be made that humans wouldn't be able to correct for. So suddenly, a, 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 a scaling of new types of manufacturing, whether it's manufacturing biologics or whether it's manufacturing materials that would take enormously difficult supply chains to deal with in the past are actually something that we know is possible due, due to progress that was made in artificial intelligence. Now, if you take artificial intelligence as a blanket and manufacturing as something that is required for any type of progress, then you can look to additive manufacturing, something like 3D printing, and picture that being a small factory. If you have a small factory that doesn't make toys, but instead uses the human imagination of how to solve a crisis like this in order to build very quickly, that's a hugely powerful technology that I think that we're seeing arise right now. We could certainly get more granular about things that are going on in synthetic biology, uh, th things that are going on in uh, genome sequencing and genome editing that will play a role, I think, and David is far more of an expert on this, that will play a role in treatments and in, in vaccines. And those things are no longer a dream of 10 years for the future. They are things that are being rushed to market right now that are leaving the research lab, moving on to pilot facilities in ways that we would have never seen without a crisis. I hate that there's a crisis. I love that people are inspired to build and build quickly. David, you've both mentioned collaboration and there's this ecosystem component as well. So can you intersect now the need to work together and how does that affect our ability to use technology and to be agile as Matthew was just describing? Certainly. And, and, and what I like about what was said is, is, is if you think about the United States, uh, most of Europe, North America, we do separate our public sector from our private sector, uh, unlike some other countries where their public sector is their private sector. And, and to date, at least from 1960 to now, in terms of responding to crises like an outbreak, even though it may feel more cacophonous, it may feel like there's more disinformation or polarization, the data at least shows that open societies have always been better at responding to crises than more closed autocratic ones. And I raise that because the way we're gonna get through COVID-19 in open societies like the United States and parts of Europe and North America, we've got to actually recognize that our private sector and our public sector have to work together. And, and as Matthew mentioned, what's great is we will build our way out of this. We will build something new that is better than what was there before. We have to make sure we get people food, we address disrupted supply chains, we address needed hospital capacity, that's only gonna be possible by people that can manufacture and build that additional capacity to those additional resources we need. Now in the past, the way we did quality control was one of two ways. Either A, we actually had centralized mechanisms where everything was done in one singular place and then there was quality control done there and or B, which was we had regulation and regulation, you went through series, several wickets of approval before finally something was allowed to go into market. Well, now we have this crisis where neither of those approaches are gonna work well. 
And so what, what Matthew is talking about is we can do decentralized production where maybe instead of it, it being in a singular, very, very large factory, it's in different hubs. And then by applying computer vision, by applying AI and an algorithm that knows what the manufacturing process should look like, you can allow that decentralized production to be as effective as if it was done in one singular large factory. And that way you have quality control there. And then two, with regulation, you can maybe convince those that are trying to think about public safety and making sure whatever gets rolled out, whether it's an N95 mask or it's a ventilator or something else that can help with hospital um, equipment and capacity, you can make sure that whatever is being produced by the computer vision and the AI looking at it, that it meets the level of quality that it actually is going to be useful as a way of convincing those that normally would have the heavy burdensome regulatory process you can have this instead in the middle of the crisis. And so I think these two things coming together, plus the fact that at least in the United States, we've invoked our National Defense Act, which allows the public sector to actually fund the private sector in ways that are much more direct than we would otherwise. I'm seeing other countries do this as well. I think this is how we get through this, is we find new ways of producing just-in-time things at the edge of where they're needed. Matthew, there's this element of resiliency that David was just talking about with decentralized manufacturing. Yes, uh, I think I think that whenever people feel a certain purpose and power of the to get to get over something and not a reliance on on a, an institution to get you there alone. We do need the support of institutions. We need to feel that we're not in this alone. I mean, we are physically isolated right now. Many of us are quarantined. We're in our homes. So we absolutely want to connect to the rest of the world. But the way that we are connecting right now is hopefully through a shared experience of empowerment and purpose. So it looks like this is a dichotomy. It has to not be a dichotomy. Uh, It's not easy. It's, a, it's, it's going from a mentality that says that the world is too comp- complicated. Um, you know, we, you hear often, and it's true, I think, I think it was Matt Ridley um, who had said that if you look at a computer mouse, it's gone through so many different hands that not a single person in the world would be able to make this. That, that spoke of something that was very optimistic about the world, that we are collaborating through trade, and that we have this interconnectedness. Now what we're saying is that actually within my house, I can do something that, that builds and can, and can actually bring something to the world of value. It's a different way of thinking, and it involves being distributed and connected through purpose at the same time. Really, it's making people believe that science and technology are even a real thing that they have any control over. This can happen right now, but we really need to talk about it and we need to show through, lead through example that it can be done. David and you, Michael, and myself, we've got to invent something, not in a month, but right now. That's a strange way to think of it. Matthew, how has this changed your thinking as CEO of Nanotronics? So I've, I've thought about this for a long time and it's, um, it's been the way Nanotronics has, has thought for a long time. We did distributed manufacturing when people were saying it was a stupid idea um, because there's a lot of upfront costs associated with it. We've been very computationally based rather than being based on heavy, expensive amounts of hardware. Um, so we've thought about it for a long time. Um, it's, it's, the timeline has changed enormously. It's just think about how funding mechanisms work. How do we work with our customers? How, how do we make what we were planning on being a two-year strategy and a two-year communication strategy and putting salespeople on there? How do we make sure that this happens now? That's a huge challenge. Um, I think one that we can get over, um, you know, we have some proof points in place, but it certainly doesn't go without challenges. And David, you are talking with business leaders and with policy leaders. 
how do you see the mindset, mind, mindset and the relationship of these leaders to their own organizations changing as a result of this kind of thinking that Matthew was just describing? So like all things, you see there's some early adopters, you see some people waiting to see where things go, and then you see some people, unfortunately, I think, paralyzed with, with everything that's changing. So I'm going to focus on the early adopters, uh, which is, you know, in some respects, uh, Matthew's a leader in that space. I think people are recognizing exactly what we've been talking about here, which is the world has changed, uh, and the way we do things has to change with it. And it's this interesting dichotomy of decentralized production yet shared, connected, both mindset, cognitively, and digitally as well. I mean, example, we're all doing this by video right now, even though we're all in physically different places. But now apply this to the manufacturing process, apply this to the delivery of services process. This is how the world is changing. It is actually thinking both in terms of connectedness and actually doing things in a distributed fashion. In terms of policymakers, I think they're recognizing that in the short term, we've got several things we've got to get in front of. We've got to get in front of hospital capacity with this crisis. We've got to get thinking about making sure people have food, especially if borders close. How can that be delivered? And then things are going to start breaking down. So what can we do about maintenance? Maintenance for things in medical facilities, but also maintenance for power plants and utilities um, that we may not be able to ship something from half a world away like we used to. And so this is actually, as Matthew said, this was probably something that was going to be naturally occurring over the next two to five to eight years. And what COVID-19 has done is it's just accelerated all that faster, which is we need to have decentralized supply chains in which everybody can be a part of it. They can even do it at home if they want to, and then they can contribute to the collective whole as opposed to this past model, which was globalization, where different things were done half a world away and then later shipped to you instead. Matthew, sounds like a major challenge to rethink a business, to rethink an organization, as you were just describing for Nanotronics and as David was describing more generally. So how do you, how do, you, how do, you do that and, and the financial implications of all of that as well? Well, I think that to, to a point I, I made a bit earlier, a lot of this was already starting to happen. Uh, uh, we have customers that are working on, for instance, next generation semiconductors. Uh, it's necessary for progress to move to the next generation of semiconductors because, you know, we, we, we have reached sort of the end of something called Moore's Law, which uh, many people are familiar with. And along with that, the cost to build factories has gone up exponentially. So uh, there's a factory right now in Korea that costs $28 billion. So while you have technological progress seen, the cost to make this has gotten to be the actual absolute opposite of me being able to make something. So that said, there are small companies and there are segments within large companies that have realized this and put a lot of research money into next generation things and things that are not solely owned by one country or one region. Now, the, ch the challenge is to make those things um, at scale. Um, so at scale can either mean a lot of us make it in small factories uh, and have proximity to our customers, or it could mean that there is a pivot adapting new types of mechanisms for large companies and large factories. This is the challenge. I think people can rise to it. Uh, and, but, you know, it, some will get left behind depending on the, bu the bureaucracy associated with either an organization or a government, but it is a big change. And, and you know, we, we can point to individual businesses that are starting to do it well. And this is going to be a very telling time on who can uh, adapt to this new way of thinking. David, is this a, are, are these challenges fundamentally technology in nature or fundamentally organizational and transformation challenges? Simply difficulty adapting? Well, I would say, I think, and I think, you know, Matthew, I think you'd agree, but correct me if I'm wrong. I think is the only thing, the technology is here and there's still some, some advances that need to be made, but you're absolutely right. It's the people side, it's the organization side, it's the policy, the process side, and the society side. And that's the hard, messy part because there is no textbook for how to get through this. 
But I think there are two things that we should keep in mind. When we had the Great Depression, the way the U.S. got through it was we invested in infrastructure projects that helped people be able to get to work. And it also built something that was that actually allowed our nation to be stronger when it emerged out of the Great Depression. Now, the challenge we have here with COVID-19 is we can't get everybody working in one place on an infrastructure project. I mean, the very nature of the outbreak makes that hard. But what, what Matthew has been talking about is this idea that maybe we could do it as a decentralized way to help both address the immediate response to the different capacity needs and supply chain needs. And then also, as we start thinking about economic recovery, maybe we do a decentralized approach to infrastructure projects that not only build up this country, we need to think beyond our borders because the world is now connected by the virus. And so we need to, if, we, if all we think about is just the United States, which that is important, then woe be it to us because we need to start thinking about not just our allies in Europe and the rest of North America, we need to start thinking about South America, Africa, Asia, Oceania. And we need to actually, I would actually dare I say, the second thing I was going to say is we might need to reach out our hand to countries like China even, where in the past, as Matthew mentioned, if you wanted to build something and you needed a small motor, you might find it really hard to find that small motor part within the United States produced within our country. You'd have to get it from either China or India. But maybe we can reach out our hand to both China and India and say, look, let's all approach this new, this new way of empowering the world to be able to do things in a distributed fashion that helps rebuild the resiliency of our planet, the health of our planet, and ultimately the good of our economy and societies. Um, like, but as you, getting back to your original question, Michael, this is gonna be a combination of advancing the tech, which is why I'm glad to be working with people like Matthew and other innovators uh, around the world. And then obviously working the combination of society, policy, and these relationships between the private and the public sector needed for us to get through this crisis together. I would say two last things. The only way through this crisis is through it. We can't, we can't hold it back. We can't deny it's there. And then ultimately at the end of the day, we are the Calvary with a slight modification. We are the distributed Calvary. Calvary. Matthew. So beautifully put. <laughs> Matthew, it sounds to me like the technology capability of distributed manufacturing in order to fully blossom, therefore requires certain types of almost profound policy shifts, thinking shifts, collaboration, ecosystem changes. What do you think about that? Is, am I off base here? I think that there are bits of each of these uh, that certainly if you were to able to transform all of those things overnight, you would be in a type of utopia by tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think, but I think that not realistic, although I think a switch in mindset is possible, but you know, I, I think uh, that there are needs to, there, I still go back to something that may be more you utopian, which is that if people believe something is possible and they have seen it invented, then everything else starts to fall in place. I mean, there's some, in, there's great historical precedent to things like this, um, whether it was, you know, a, a directly a war effort. Um, you know, there, there was some government, there was a really interesting government project uh, in World War II that was not the Manhattan Project. Um, but you know, the United States was cut off, for instance, from uh, getting uh, rubber from uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so there was a government commission and several private companies in the tire industry who sent the inventor of PVC, this guy Waldo Seaman, um, to you know pull this together to to, to invent a synthetic uh, tire, to invent synthetic rubber. We would have a tough time have winning that war without this having happened. And that was a radical change to supply chain. You know, we were getting rubber from somewhere else. Now we had to do it here. And then within the war ends, when the war is over, you then have uh, synthetic tires all around the world and then everybody benefits from it. This is not, I'm certainly not saying we're at war with other countries, but we are within limitations now that we didn't have before. And I think addressing this kind of potential, yes, that was policy 
in a sense that it was a government call to action to organizations. So companies had to get behind it. Companies ended up eventually benefiting from it. And then the world benefited from it. Now it's taking each of these and figuring out what are the most important ones to do right now. And I know that, that David would know much better than I would, but which parts of this are being discussed most on a government level. Um, I speak to our customers and know which ones they're addressing the most. On a small scale, I see what we're addressing. I, it is definitely going to be, and David could tell you, I think a, a combination of all of these things. And yes, a challenge, but it's, I think one that is almost a chain reaction once we see that it is even possible. I love what, what you were saying, Matthew, about it's a chain reaction once we see what's possible. I, I think you're absolutely right. It's almost like in, until, until Steve Jobs showed the world the, the iPhone, people were building phones a certain way. And once they saw it was possible, then it was a very seismic shift. And so I think what you're talking about here, Matthew, is can we show a new way of doing supply chains, doing manufacturing that is beneficial? Yes, it feels disruptive to people, but it's beneficial both to the immediate crisis and ultimately, it probably is better for the world as a whole as a result when we get through this. As we finish up, I have to ask you both a couple of questions that I think are really important. And number one, maybe I'll direct this first to Matthew and then David, you can jump in. So Matthew, what advice do you have to other business leaders at this particular moment in time? I think to collaborate with your neighbors, and by neighbors, I don't mean actually the house next to me, although that could be too, but to collaborate with the businesses that do things that you don't do that are probably are very close to you. People don't use machine shops anymore that are close to them. They, they source from elsewhere. Let's look at what is actually around us and how we can put pieces together. We have this great means of communication, like we're doing now. This was what this last industrial revolution, the communications revolution, allowed us to make these connections. Now we have to see what physical proximity, through being able to speak by using all of the tools through the internet um, that is available to us now, how can that start um, us to collaborate on things that we didn't have to collaborate on before or didn't know that it was possible to. And David, your thoughts on this issue? So amplifying what Matthew said, think about it. Um, you know, the, the, the computer revolution was started in a lot of cases by people working in garages because they could, and it was digital. I think what Matthew is now talking about is let's actually start thinking about instead of it being just a computer revolution, a digital revolution, let's think about a manufacturing and a physical um, a revolution in which now you can do things either in your equivalent of your garage or your, your own local company by working with your local neighbors. The addition, I would say, is also wherever possible, reach out to your local government, your state government. Federal government, I know is hard, it's kind of monolithic, and that's why we try to, we try to actually navigate through everything, but state and local governments have very urgent needs, both in the immediate to this and the longer term need. And whatever the way, again, we'll get through this, and I'll, I'll just say it again. The only way through this crisis is through it, and we are the distributed cavalry. So whatever business leaders can do and public sector leaders can do to be that cavalry, we'll, we'll merge in this stronger than ever before. And a final question for you both, which I think is a very important question, and David, I'll, I'll start with you. What advice do you have for policymakers at this very, very difficult time? It's interesting you asked that because just about 30 minutes ago, I was actually talking to a very high level policymaker that was actually asking. And so a lot of what we just covered here was very similar to the advice I gave. The additional, I, the additional thing I would say to policymakers is we've got to figure out accelerated ways of engaging uh, the private sector, not just in the United States, but also then working with other nations to get them to do the same thing in their part. Because as I said, up until now, 1960 onwards, Open societies have always been better at responding to crises than more closed ones. I would hate for COVID-19 to be the one that actually disproves that and that we discover that open societies ended up just polarizing us, causing misinformation and inaction and paralysis. So it's incumbent upon policymakers to extend as much as possible both the hand saying, here's what I need. Can people help do it and listen and learn? And then two, it may be actually thinking about accelerated ways to directly engage the private sector 
of the United States and encourage our allies to do the same because the only way through this crisis is we will build a better world from what's occurring right now as a result. And Matthew, your advice for policymakers? Oh, I would, I, I hate to be unoriginal, but I'd agree completely with David. Uh, it's a, a amount of, I'm saying that people have to trust that science and technology exists and that we can have a way to invent our way out of this. Policymakers, governments have to believe this as well. And they can believe it through seeing what is going on and they can believe that quality can be put into a system and that these distributed networks can be ignited through funding by them, from encouragement, from messaging, all of these things that help address an immediate concern. And Matthew, just before we go, we're very grateful for your taking your time and David, of course, as well. But please give us the 15 second pitch on nanotronics so we know what you really do. So nanotronics is very much doing the things that we're talking about right now. We are making factories much more efficient, revolutionizing the way that manufacturing has been done for the last 50 years. Things have been an assembly line of large factories that move throughout different parts of a process. We use artificial intelligence and robotics to bring these together so that you can have these type of smaller, affordable, distributed, and high quality systems. And Matt, and Michael, if I could just add real quick, because I've, I've enjoyed working with Matthew, and here's what I would say. And I would say nanotronics is the, it provides both the saddles and the horses for the distributed cavalry of today and tomorrow. And I'm, I'm honored to be working with them because in the oh. Atlantic Council with Geotech, we recognize this is the world we're going to. And so as much as possible, working with vanguards like them, uh, they, are, they, are, they are pioneering the distributed cavalry that we're needing. Oh, thank you, David. So nice. Well, thank you both. We've been speaking with Matthew Putman. He is the CEO of Nanotronics and David Bray of the Atlantic Council. Thank you both. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you both.